Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Bob Stiegel, and uh, I'm here to talk about a proposal written by Guy Davidson and myself to include facilities for linear algebra in the standard C++ library. As always, my talk is sponsored by the American East, Co East Const Association of America, an important trade uh, association everyone should belong to. All right, structure of the talk. I'd like to give a little bit of background. I assume that if you're coming to a talk on linear algebra, you probably have a good handle on the fundamentals, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time lingering on that. I'd like to talk about some high-level goals that Guy and I set out for ourselves as we began developing the proposal. I'll provide some important definitions, and the reason for doing that is to provide disambiguation between the different, the different uses of overloaded terms. I'll then talk a little bit about the aspects of designing the interface that's part of the proposal and how those design aspects, the, the exploration of those aspects, led to a definition of the, this proposal's scope and the requirements that we tried to fulfill as we wrote the proposal. I'll, also talk, I'll then move on to talk about the interface design itself. I will give a sort of top-down recursive demonstration walking through some compile time computations to show how it works or how it's intended to work. I'll then give uh, a handful of demonstrations of how one could customize the behavior of the library if, if, if it's implemented according to this interface, and a quick description of things that are yet to be done, you know, what's on our to-do list. So, this is a discussion of P1385. Right now, if you look on, uh, if you look it up on WG21.link, uh, that right now provides the R1 version. Guy, Davidson, and I are currently in the process of writing R2 to present at Cologne in a few weeks. Uh, R1 is pretty much out of date already. At the end of the talk, I'll give you, if you're interested, I'll give you, I provide a link to my GitHub account where you can uh, watch the work in progress if you so desire. As I mentioned, my uh, co-author is Guy Davidson, and uh, uh, Michael Wong, who is the chairman of SG14, uh, was kind enough to set up a little specialized linear algebra study group, which I, I run the call. It's once a month. A handful of people dial in. We talk about P1385 and other ideas surrounding it and some other proposals as well. If you're interested uh, in linear algebra or participating in that discussion, I encourage you to follow the SG14 reflector, uh, and uh, I make announcements for the calls. Uh, the call is the first, the first Wednesday of the month. So you should look on the reflector around that time. All right, so a little bit of background. I'm not a mathematician, and I don't play one on TV, so uh, I'm going to keep this brief so as not to embarrass myself. What is linear algebra? Well. The most succinct and easiest to understand definition for me that I could find was from the fount of all knowledge, Wikipedia. Uh, the branch of mathematics concerning linear equations and linear functions and their representations through matrices and vector spaces. I came to learn that linear algebra is central to many areas of mathematics and in fact uh, geometry can be formulated in terms of linear algebra. I did not know this and I don't know how it's done. But uh, Wikipedia tells me it's so, and thus I believe it. Uh, it is a useful uh, mathematical discipline for science and engineering. Uh, of course, many phenomena are modeled using linear equations and linear algebra. Uh, over the years, the state of the art has evolved in, in a way that you can provide or you can perform computations incredibly efficient, efficiently with linear algebra. And of course, it's used in a whole bunch of areas in life, and this is just a few, you know, graphics, machine learning, finance, analytics, medical imaging, which is where I used it a few jobs ago, signal processing, nuclear simulations, all kinds of things. If there's a thing that requires some sort of mathematical modeling, it's like linear algebra is almost always the first tool that people start using. So as we set out thinking about what an interface should provide, we wanted to look at it from the point of the user. Um, remember, the proposals for the standard and for the library uh, describe 
proposed interfaces, not implementations. So we are attempting to provide an interface that meets certain requirements and is also implementable according to those requirements. So let's look at the requirements from the perspective of everyone. Everyone that uses this, what are they going to want to use? What are they going to want to have? Well, they want it to be easy to use. It should be easy to use. There should be some aliases or types which you can instantiate and go to work quickly and get something done, right? It should not be difficult to, to start using. It should be expressive. You should be able to create uh, expressions that are similar to what you might write with pencil and paper and have them work. It should have reasonably high performance. I don't think any implementer is going to be capable of providing the best possible performance on whatever platforms they support. But our goal is to provide an interface that is implementable in such a way that the performance that an implementer can provide is pretty darn good for 90% of uses. However, there is a, a group of super users of linear algebra. And here I'm thinking of my friends from the national labs. They want customization. They want customization, they want performance, customization high performance, and they want customizable high performance. And they want support for what I think of as being non-traditional computing environments. Linear algebra computations that occur across multiple machines in a distributed environment, not just on a single GPU or a single CPU. So let's talk about some of our goals. Well, we hope with this proposal to provide a set of vocabulary types describing linear algebra. And we want to provide a public interface that's intuitive, that is teachable, that is customizable, and also that mimics traditional mathematical notation. And as I mentioned a few seconds ago, we want to exhibit competitive, not ultimate, but competitive out-of-the-box performance. So let's talk about customization. In terms of customization, we'd like to provide through this interface a set of building blocks for managing memory, uh, the source of memory, ownership, lifetime, layout, access, managing other resources. Uh, in this case, we're thinking of execution contexts that might be used in distributed computing or with executors. You know, that is on the, on the to-do list. Uh, and also building blocks for representing other interesting math types like tensors or quaternions. We'd like to provide a set of straightforward tools to allow users to customize the behavior of the library. We want to enable users to optimize performance for their specific problem and their specific hardware. And we want to be able to do that by providing a reasonable level of granularity to perform that customization. And I hope by the end when I show you some of the examples of how behavior can be customized, you'll be convinced that we're on the right path. Ultimately, we want users to only be required to implement a minimal set of types and functions in order to do the customization to solve their problem. I'll go through some definitions quickly. So linear algebra, we think of it as being the study of vector spaces. And a vector space is a collection of vectors where these are objects that can be added together and multiplied by scalars. When I think of vectors, I think of Euclidean vectors in three-dimensional space. Uh, as a physics major, of course, you use vectors to represent displacements, uh, electric fields, forces, momentum. Uh, from a mathematical perspective, the dimension of a vector space is the number of coordinates that are required to specify any point within that space. A matrix from a mathematical perspective is a rectangular arrangement of numbers or symbols or expressions that's organized in rows and columns. And of course we all know that a matrix that has R rows in C columns is said to have size R by C. Matrices are useful because they provide a way of representing linear transformations from one vector space to another. At the end of the day that's kind of what they do. An element is an individual member of that rectangular arrangement of things that comprise the matrix. Uh, elements are indexed uh, in such a, are use, traditionally use one-based indexing. Uh, so the row index varies from one to R inclusive and the column index varies from one to C inclusive. 
And of course, there's matrix notation that, uh, you know, A11 is in the upper left-hand corner and ARC is the element in the lower right-hand corner. A row vector is a commonly used shorthand for a matrix that contains a single row. It has size 1 by C. Uh, the matrix, the rows of a matrix, you know, are sometimes called row vectors. Uh, in, this, in, in this version of the interface, we do not distinguish between row vectors and column vectors, which themselves uh, are uh, matrices that represent a single column uh, of another matrix. The rank of a matrix uh, is the dimension of the vector space that's spanned by its rows and columns. So if you have a 3x3 three three orthogonal matrix, it has rank 3. If you have a... Only, only if it's... Oh. If you had a 3x4 matrix, the highest possible rank of that matrix would be 3. And from linear algebra, of course, we know that the, uh, uh, the rank is equal to the maximum number of linearly independent rows or columns. All right. These are not some quite, we use these in, in turn thinking about math. Uh, there was a little bit of hesitation whether to include the next set of terms as math or C++ terms. I just, we decided to lump them under math. So we think of the term element transforms as being non-arithmetic operations that modify the relative positions of elements in matrix, like a transpose, a column exchange, or a row exchange. We're going to call those, for the purposes of, of defining our interface, we're going to call those element transforms. Element arithmetic, we're going to define this as being the operations that read or modify the values of individual elements independently of other elements. And we're going to define matrix arithmetic as being some arithmetical operation which occurs on matrices or vectors in their entirety instead of individual elements. Yes, Jasper. Uh, so the Hadamard product would go to element arithmetic as an element-wise product. Yeah. It would fall under both, element and matrix-wise. Right. Uh, we make these distinctions to, to, to sort of uh, you'll see when we get to the next slide, we make these distinctions to provide a cutoff in the set of the requirements that we provide. Okay, so decompositions. Well, decompositions, you know, there's no formal definition, but we define them as being complex sequences of arithmetic operations, element arithmetic, and element transforms. All of those previous three things that are performed upon a matrix to determine important mathematical properties of that matrix. Uh, one might do an LU decomposition in order to back solve a problem or determine, uh, you know, if, if, a, if a square matrix is in fact, uh, you know, has full rank. Eigen decompositions. This is a term that we use just to lap, to, to uh, lump all sorts of computations for determining the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the matrix. And we just lump this under this term, Eigen decompositions, for now. So now let's turn to, to, to a C++ perspective, a, a type design perspective rather than, than math. So for the purposes of this paper and through, throughout the rest of the presentation, I'm, we use the term math object generically to mean one of the two C++ types, matrix or vector, that are described in the interface. We use the term storage as a synonym for memory. Uh, and mostly because memory has a specific connotation and one might think of storage as being slightly more general than RAM. So we use the term storage. We use the term dense to mean a math object whose representation has storage allocated for every element. And we use the term sparse in the, in the opposite sense to mean a math object with storage that's allocated only for its non-zero elements. Yes, David. Where do, where do uh, symmetric matrices fit into those two categories? That's up to how you decide to implement them. And uh, those are actually the, the, the thinking about things like upper, lower, triangular, banded, symmetric matrices actually fall beyond the scope of our proposal. Oh, okay. So another important term is that of engines. And engines in our conception are implementation types that manage 
all of the resources associated with a math object on behalf of the math object. These include things like element storage ownership and lifetime, access to individual elements, be it read-only or read-write, resizing and reserving elements if necessary or appropriate, execution contexts at some point in the future. In this design, in this design of this interface, an engine object is a private member of some containing math object. A matrix contains a matrix engine. Other than appearing as a template parameter, engines do not participate in the math object's public interface. They provide private implementation, but they don't participate in the interface. Yes? Do they appear as a, both a template parameter and a constructor uh, parameter? No. Or, no? Okay. Only as a template parameter. Okay, so engines are not stateful. They are stateful, but they, are, they, they don't participate in the interface. Everything, everything necessary for constructing to their, their state is forward to them from the enclosing math object. Maybe, maybe you'll see when we get to the code. I see now. Okay. Are, are math objects owning of engines? Math objects own engines. Engines may or may not own the resources they manage. Okay. All right. So what's traits type? We're all used traits. We're all familiar with traits. I think of traits as being a a stateless class, usually stateless, uh, a class or class template whose members provides an interface that's normalized over some set of types or template parameters. Uh, a canonical and very early example of traits is char traits, which are used for std string, right? Uh, they often appear as parameters in class or function templates, and this interface proposal is no exception. Row and column capacity. Excuse me. These we use these terms to mean the maximum number of rows and columns that a math object could possibly have. And we use the terms row size and column size to mean the number of rows and columns, respectively, that a math object actually has. And of course, the row size and column size has to be less than, less than or equal to the corresponding row and column capacities. And capacity to combine parentheses? Or? Both. It depends on the engine. But it has the same meaning as capacity in vectors. It does have the same meaning. You'll see. I'll, I'll come back to it. If you still have the question when we look at the interface, come back and ask again. We use the term fixed size to mean an engine type whose row and column sizes are fixed and known at compile time. We use the term fixed capacity to mean an engine type whose row and column capacities are fixed and known at compile time. A dynamic, dynamically resizable refers to an engine whose row and column sizes and capacities can be changed and set at runtime. So let's disambiguate some terms. The word matrix is frequently abused by C and C++ programmers to mean a general purpose array with some arbitrary number of indices, right? We hear it all the time. We specifically use the term matrix in, you know, uh, that font to mean the mathematical object, and uh, in the fixed size font to mean the C++ template that models the matrix mathematical idea. We use the term array to mean a singular multidimensional array in the C++ sense, which itself has no invariants that pertain to some higher level meaning or uh, other, other invariants. An array has elements and there is no invariance between the elements themselves, whereas in a matrix, that, that may be different. Uh, along the same lines, vector, and uh, I ranted last year for a little while about how I dislike the term vector, uh, is also abused by programmers in our field to mean a dynamically resizable one-dimensional array. Again, we use vector to mean the mathematical object or the type that models that object, and we use the term linear array to mean a single dimensional array in the C++ sense. Now, this is a tricky one. In programming, the term dimension often re refers to the number of indices that are required to access the elements in an array, or an element of an array. In linear algebra, however, a vector space, V, is said to be n-dimensional if there exist n linearly independent vectors, basis vectors, perhaps, that span V. So, 
two different but very closely, uh, two different but related meanings. We use dimension in both senses, and unfortunately, there's no way really to use different terms for it. So for example, a vector that describes a point in an electric field, it's a one-dimensional data structure implemented as a three-dimensional vector. It represents a vector in a three-dimensional space, but the data structure is one-dimensional because you use one, one index to access its elements. Similarly, uh, a rotation matrix that might be a three-dimensional rotation matrix that might be used in a game engine is a two-dimensional data structure because you use two indices to access its elements composed of three-dimensional row vectors or column vectors that represent the vector space upon which it operates. Rank is another tricky one. Uh, of course, it's used in linear algebra to represent the dimension of the space span, spanned by the rows or columns. In tensor analysis, rank is often used, the word rank is used as a synonym for a tensor's order. The C++ standard uses the term rank as a synonym for dimension. Uh, and there it is, uh, the, the section and the quote. We avoid using this word. <laughs> Our first uh, linear algebra calls were quite confusing as we were talking about the ranks of matrices and, and the ranks of, of arrays and the ranks of tensors, and it got to be too much. Could, could you, couldn't you just use rank for the first use of dimension? Then you don't use dimension twice? I could do that, but I have to, I have to arbitrarily pick, a, pick one meaning of rank and the other for dimension. Well, the standard meaning of rank is your first meaning of dimension, right? Well, it could be that that Lug forces us to make that choice. All right, so let's think about how we're going to design this thing. Memory. Memory, of course, is important. Storage. So what are some aspects about memory that we need to think about? Well, of course, the location of memory. The memory used by a math object can be in some external buffer that's allocated from a global heap or a custom allocator. It can be in an internal buffer that's part of the math object itself. It could exist, collect, it could refer collectively to a set of buffers distributed across multiple processes or multiple machines, right? So we have to think about where is memory located? We have to think about the addressing model to get to that memory. If you've seen my talks on fancy pointers, you know I like to talk about addressing models. The memory that's used might be addressable via some sort of fancy pointer. Uh, maybe I'm doing some sort of machine learning thing and I want to put my linear algebra stuff in a shared buffer so that my you know, my, my autonomous vehicle can have input to one side of the shared matrix from input and another side reading it and processing it. Ownership. A math object might own and manage its memory, or a math object might, through its engine, might use a const or mutable view to memory that's managed and owned by somebody else. We need to think about capacity and resizability, which is why I introduced those terms earlier. In some problem domains, it's useful for a math object to have excess storage capacity so that resizes don't require reallocations. When I worked in functional MRI, we had a problem where every four seconds, we had a, every two to four seconds, we had a new sample coming in. We were doing multiple linear regression in a highly overdetermined problem. We'd have regressor matrices that were on the order of two to 500 rows with maybe 10 to 20 regressors in the columns. So it's a very highly overdetermined problem. Every time a new sample point came in, there would be a new row in the regressor matrix and new rows in the matrix that represented the signal. We'd end up doing an SVD and uh, computing the betas. Anyways, the point is that every, if I had to resize uh, the regressor matrix and the data matrix, every time a new sample came in, I'd be wasting a lot of time. So we had excess capacity and we would size into that capacity just like you do with vector. It depends. It depends on your application. For fMRI analysis, it's critical, right? Yes, For games, it is not. What I mean is that only when you resize in columns is that then you can exploit not allocating something else. No, you can resize, you can resize columns and rows. I've done it. You can add padding to the rows. You can add padding. Out the other direction. Right, you can add paddings to the rows. You can add paddings to the columns. So, as I just mentioned, in other problem domains, like graphics, math objects are small, they're fixed size, they never need to be resized. 
Element layout's another consideration. In C and C++, the default for, for arrays, uh, in, you, which you might use to represent a matrix, is row, major, dense, and rectangular. In Fortran, the default, at least many years ago when I did Fortran, the default was column major. I don't know if that's changed. Okay. <laughs> One of the universal constants like E or H bar. Okay. Uh, you might have element layouts that correspond to matrices that are upper, lower, triangular matrices or banded. And of course, element layouts might be sparse. We think about element types, the types of the elements themselves, C++ only provides a small set of, of arithmetic types that you might want to put into a matrix. Sometimes you want to use other types. Lots of people right now are working on, on, on additional types that represent numbers in some way that they, they have proposals for in front of the committee. Fixed point calculations, uh, types that do arbitrary precision floating point. John McFarlane has an interesting proposal for something he calls elastic integers. Uh, you have complex numbers, which are part of the standard. Uh, so, you know, float and double and long double are not the only interesting things. Uh, keeping in mind that an element type may actually have to allocate memory. Suppose you have some flexible high precision floating point number. Individual elements might allocate memory. So the implementation and the interface cannot assume that elements are trivial types, right? Which makes managing the padding Interesting, right? Not impossible. Here's where we really get into the, into the weeds. Expressions with mixed element types. In general, if you have multiple primitive types, int, float, double, in an arithmetic expression, in a sense, the resulting type is the largest of all those types. It's the type with the most precision or that can contain uh, the results of the computation. And the principle behind that is that information should be preserved in an expression. So, in our interface, we call the process of determining the resulting element type in an expression, in, an, in a binary expression, element promotion. We'll see some examples of that. Um, about elements. Yes. So the question is, do we have any requirements about elements having some relationship or dependency on other elements close to them? No, we do not. So in principle, you, you can allow that. that. When you modify one element, another element can be modified at the same time, implicitly through the computation. Aliasing. I, I, do we allow aliasing? We don't, we don't comment on the subject of aliasing. disallow it. Otherwise, there's no way to implement some of the algorithms you propose because you need to know when you apply a scale to an element if it's also applying the scale to the symmetric yeah. equivalent. Oh, I see what you're saying. I've not thought about that. I'd have to sit and think about it. But now that you, now that you say it, David, I think I, I think I agree with you. Yes. Okay. L let me move on because I've got a lot to get through here. Okay. So, Consider, that, uh, consider whether the, the situation where you have an expression with mixed engine types. I have a matrix that has a fixed size engine and I'm adding to it a matrix that has a dynamically resizable engine, right? What is the resulting engine type of my result? What should it be? In analogy with that of the idea of element promotion, we believe that, oh, look at that, I spelled general wrong. The resulting engine should be at least as general as the most general of all of the engine types that participate in the expression. And we call this process determining what the resulting engine type is, engine promotion. Let's think about arithmetic expressions. Users are going to want to optimize specific operations. Uh, they may want to do a SIMD based uh, matrix matrix and matrix vector multiplication. You know, the th example I always think of in this case is uh, affine transforms for game programming where you've got maybe some optimized 4x4 four four representation to represent, you know, rotation, translation, scaling, shearing, and you want some fast multiplication for that, right? Well, two operands in an expression may be associated with different customizations. And if that's the case, 
we have to decide which customization to apply to the specific arithmetic operation. And we'll see an example of that. And we call that process operation traits promotion. So in an arithmetic expression where we have a ma two matrices, let's say we're adding them, the matrices have some element type, they have some engine type, and associated with each of those objects is some proposed set of operations. If I have two matrices and they have those types are different between them, somehow I have to resolve the differences between the elements, the engines, and the customized arithmetic operations that go with them. Those are the three kinds of, propo of promotion that the proposal covers. So taking all this into account, we developed the, we made the following statement of scope and set out the following requirements. First of all, as a statement of principle, we think that the best approach for standardizing this set of facilities for C++23, which is our target, is an approach that's layered, iterative, and incremental. And consequently, this proposal is one for very basic linear algebra stuff only. Uh, we think it provides a minimal set of components and arithmetic operations necessary to provide a reasonable basic level of functionality. Higher level functionality can be built upon this proposal and we strongly encourage people who are interested to do so. We want to, if you're interested in doing this, we want to hear your feedback about how easy or difficult it is to build some higher level facility like let's say a generic SVD that you'd have to be very ambitious, but let's say you wanted to try that upon the, the facilities that this proposal provides. From an abstract perspective, at a high level, you know, we want to provide a set of types and functions to perform basic matrix arithmetic in finite spaces, not infinite spaces. So we need facilities for determining whether a type can be a matrix element. We need types that implement engines that manage storage. We need types that model matrices, row vectors, and column vectors. We need, we need support for element transforms. Remember, that's manipulation of the location of elements in the matrix. We need support for element arithmetic, modifying individual elements of the matrix. We need support for possibly mixed type matrix arithmetic. We'd like to make it easy to use and extensible. From a more concrete perspective, we need to model these mathematical ideas. We use traits types to validate element type. We use class templates to implement engines. We use class templates to, to implement matrices and vectors. We provide arithmetic operators for addition, subtraction, and negation of matrices and vectors. We provide arithmetic operators for scalar multiplication of matrices and vectors, and arithmetic operations for non-scalar multiplication of matrices and vectors, i.e. matrix matrix, Vector matrix, matrix vector, vector vector. Last level three. Sort of, yes. Uh, our original proposal, and if you read R1, you'll see there were, there were distinct types, row vector and column vector. And the reason for that was my pedantic need to distinguish between inner product and outer product. In R1, a row vector times a column vector gave you an inner product and the result type was a scalar. A column vector times a row vector was an outer product and gave you a matrix. Our review in Kona revealed that people thought that I was being too pedantic and no one cared about that, dis dis uh, that difference and that no one really cares about the outer product in real life, so let's just have one vector type and vector-vector multiplication will be the inner product. Outer product will be a named function that will be part of a succession paper. Yes, David model these mathematical ideas. We have a feature in the standard that uses the term model that's concepts. Did you think about using concepts instead of class templates? So concepts are on the to-do list, right? Having watched Eric and Casey uh, struggle with concepts definition for ranges, we decided not to tackle that initially. Right? It, it is definitely on the radar. It's something that needs to be done. For now, though, we wanted to get other parts of the interface working. So we want to make it flexible. We want to use traits types to ensure that mixed type expressions are supported. We want to make it relatively, uh, the extensibility be relatively easy to use by providing facilities for integrating new element types, for customizing engines, 
for integrating custom implementations of arithmetic operations, and we want to minimize the number of customization points in namespace std. In this proposal, there are two customization points, which are traits types that exist in namespace std, that a user may want to specialize uh, along the lines of, say, allocator traits or pointer traits, right? Considered but excluded. There was a long discussion about tensors. We decided to exclude tensors from this and concentrate only on linear algebra concepts. The reasoning, uh, without spending too much time on it, was as follows. Every rank two tensor can be represented by a square matrix. Yes, but not every square matrix is a tensor. The class invariants in the public interface are different between those of a matrix and a tensor. So matrices are not Liskov substitutable for tensors. And because this substitutability did not apply, we decided just to punt on the concept of tensors that are the, I'm sorry, not the concept with a big C, the idea of supporting tensors, right? We also had discussions about supporting quaternions. Well, quaternions model very different ideas from math than vectors, right, or matrices. And also, their invariants in public interface are different from that of vectors. Once again, Liskov substitutability does not apply. So we punted on this issue as well. That being said, there's no reason why a quaternion could not be an element of a vector or a matrix, because it certainly has the requisite non-commutative uh, ring properties. But we are not implementing those as part of this proposal. Um, yes, sir. Yes. So the comment is, is that the standard library is the only place where a quaternion implementation should occur because it needs to be reinterpret castable to an array of floats or doubles or whatever the underlying element representation is, right? Uh, okay. This is going quickly. The interface and the components. I'm going to go through a high-level description of the interface. I'm going to blow through it. It's actually very straightforward. I hope that it will all make sense and not provide any major surprises to you. I think the interesting part will be when I get to the, to the, recursive, uh, uh, the recursive discussion of how the facilities are decided, uh, designed to work together. So I mentioned engines. These are types that manage resources. Uh, they manage memory. They manage element access and update. Engines don't need to be owning. They can be views, and I'll show you an example of the transpose engine, which is simply a view. It swaps the indices in the indexing operator. The math objects model mathematical abstractions. They use engines to manage their elements. The, they, they exist to provide a consolidated interface to the arithmetic operators. So they don't have to have a different set of arithmetic operators for every engine. Instead, I just have a small set of arithmetic operators for matrix and vector. And underneath the hood, matrix and vector implement their functionality using different engines. Operators provide the desired syntax. We provide four operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and negation. Traits types support all of this stuff. And the mental picture that I have, oh, and by the way, the traits types are used to provide, to perform type computations at compile time, and the arithmetic traits uh, perform runtime computations of a matrix arithmetic. So the picture I have in my mind is this. On the outside, you've got the main, the main user visible pieces, which are the engines, the math objects, and the arithmetic operators. And in the middle, keep, you know, acting as glue, making it all work, are the traits types. So thinking about traits, there are several, several categories of traits, different sets of traits that have different missions to support this. Numeric traits, these are traits which specify and they test the properties of types that purport to be numeric. Uh, we provide a numeric traits customization point, providing full or partial specialization by the user to specify, to opt in and specify, my type foo is an arithmetic type, it's legitimate to use it as an element of a vector or a matrix. It's a very simple thing to do. Element promotion traits, these are traits that perform the process, the, the, the compile time process of determining the resulting element type uh, from an arithmetic operation. Engine promotion traits, they solve the problem of deciding 
What's my resulting engine type? If I have a fixed size engine and a dynamically resizable engine, I have to compute a resulting engine, what's it going to be? Engine promotion traits make that de determination. We have arithmetic traits which determine the resulting type and value of an arithmetic operation. We have operation traits. Operation traits are sort of a global container that contain the element promotion, engine promotion, and arithmetic traits uh, that are to be associated with an operand. And when you see the interface, hopefully that will make sense. The operation traits are a template parameter to matrix and vector. And finally, we have the second customization point, what we call operation selector traits. These are traits that are used by the operator implementation to select the operation traits of the resulting type. If I'm adding two matrices for the resulting matrix, I need to know the element type, the engine type, uh, and the type of the operation traits that are going to be associated with my resulting matrix. As I mentioned, this is, this is the second customization point, one of two. There are also a wide variety of implementation-specific private traits. I'm not going to go into those. Uh, they employ the usual host of fundamental metaprogramming tools uh, of particular interest. Uh, and if someone remembers, reminds me at the end, we use type detection a lot under the hood to make something very interesting happen. I didn't make any slides about that interesting stuff because that's almost another presentation. So, yes? Do you guys have space uh, traits or space promotion traits? Meaning that, for example, you can say whether some object of a lower dimensionality space can be promoted to a higher one by adding a zero at the end of the vector or something. So the question is, do we have a spatial, pr the concept of spatial promotion traits that would allow one to... Uh, promote somehow a two-dimensional vector into the three-dimensional vector. Oh, to promote a two-dimensional vector into a three-dimensional vector. No, that sort of promotion is handled by resize. Okay, so the numeric element traits. I'm going to run through this very quickly. So at the top is a, is a traits type number traits. This is the, when I mentioned a customization point, this is the specific thing that one might customize. We have some new uh, predicate traits types, is complex, is field, is ring, is non-commutative ring. And finally, is matrix element. This is the predicate type that the engine used to determine whether or not the thing you're trying to instantiate me in terms of is in fact suitable to become an element. There's some discussion about whether is matrix element is really necessary or not. For the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to say yes it is. What would that mean, is matrix element? You could not instantiate a matrix of string. It's a type predicate. I'm sorry. Are these supposed to be customization points? So the question is, are the predicate traits, and by predicate traits, I mean the ones that begin with is underscore, yeah. right? The predicate traits are not intended to be customization points. Okay. The predicate traits that exist in st stood right now under type traits are not customization points, right? The only two customization points, well, the first of the two customization points is number traits. It is intended to be customizable, just like, say, pointer traits or allocator traits are customizable. Um, I know those use a class equal void as a second parameter, so you can use enable if, like, to specialize. No, they don't. Well, this is their interface, okay. right? This is their interface. This is not their implementation. One could implement them in different ways. Yeah, but if you want to, if you want to specialize a trait using like say enable if, you need a second parameter, a second default void parameter to be able to do that. No, not anymore. <coughs> not anymore? Okay. You can use requires clause. Oh yeah, that's right. I see two questions. Zach, why don't you go first? Um, so is this the place where you're looking to add concept at some point? So, so concepts you? might be able to, so the question is, is this a place to, to use concepts? So we're still discussing this, and, and honestly, I'm not super familiar with concepts. I don't know whether we could take out this customization point number traits entirely and, and replace its mission, the mission that it fulfills, with concepts in the engine types or the matrix types themselves. It may be possible that that, that can be done. So, okay, well, we've not gotten that far yet. Sorry, there was a question back? Okay, 
Yes. Uh, in a game drive that it feels, for example, it's not a customization point. That's correct. So the how, how would I do like uh, a fine tune? So give me a second and you'll okay. see. Let me see. Okay. Just to answer the question, is I, I suspect that if this makes it all the way to the wording stage, this implicitly defines a concept, right? These are the things that have to have <coughs> certain values in order to be used with the matrix. And I think by the time you get to actual LWG wording, this would be a concept uh, in that wording. So yes, that, that very well could be. Uh, so to, 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 answer, uh, to answer your question, let me get a few slides further and you'll see how, at least in this proposal, we propose that the predicate traits are implemented. And I think they'll answer your question. Okay, uh, these are some tag types that define certain properties. Uh, these are useful for implementing engines. I'm not gonna talk about what they are or what they mean. They're not important to the rest of the conversation, but they are part of the public interface, so I included them. They may go away. Uh, oh, and by the way, I should say, I didn't say this at first, uh, and I, ne I neglected. We're proposing a new sub namespace, math, stood math that these facilities would go into. There's a proposal, there, I think there's a proposal for some constants, some named constants and stuff, and that proposal also, uh, that predates ours, wants to put several constants inside a stood math namespace. So we're sort of piggybacking on that idea. Okay, so let's talk, this is the engines that are part of the proposal so far. We have a dynamically resizable vector and matrix engine. There are two template parameters, the element type and the allocator type. We have uh, uh, that the, and these particular types own their storage. We have owning engines that for fixed size internal storage. Uh, we have a fixed size vector engine, a fixed size matrix engine. Uh, the vector engine has one template, uh, non-type template parameter that specifies how many elements are in the vector. The matrix engine has two which specify the number of rows and columns. We call this, this getting back to the term of fixed type, it's fixed type because the number of rows and columns are fixed and known at compile time. We also have some examples, a part of the proposal here of non-owning view style engines, a matrix column view, a matrix row view, and a matrix transpose view. We have No particular reason. It, it could be, so that's a, that's a subject, that's a question really that I, I intend. To, so the question is why do we use int32 to represent the size parameters? We could have used size t or some other number. I thought, honestly, I thought by using int32, somebody in committee would raise the question and say, why didn't you use something? And then people would argue about it and come back with a definitive answer about what is the best integral type to use there. <laughs> so it's sort, of a, it's sort of a red flag to wave, wave in front of the bull to get an answer about something because I don't have any firm feeling about it. I don't, and I didn't, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm scared that it might launch into the whole signed versus unsigned debate again, <laughs> in which case I might have to slip out and get something to eat and come back, you know, after someone is left standing. Okay. I mentioned the matrix operation traits. I'll show you an implementation of that. It's forward declared here because for vector and matrix, it is a second template parameter and it's defaulted. So vector and matrix have two template parameters. The first template parameter is the engine type. And if we recall, the engine types are themselves parameterized in terms of an element type. I wanted to minimize the number of template parameters because I don't like the way the containers are built. So, I'm putting the element type in the engine. The second template parameter is the operation traits type. Here it's defaulted to matrix operation traits, which is the default set of operation traits that the library provides. So what are the various, what are the various traits, right? Well, as I mentioned, we have four arithmetic operations that we support. Addition, subtraction, negation, multiplication. For each of those operations, we provide a set of element promotion traits. We provide a set of engine promotion traits. You see on the bottom there. We provide a set of arithmetic traits. And you may ask yourself, you may ask me, Bob, why do you have traits for different operations, right? It's possible <clears throat> that one may somehow want to define a type such that 
the resulting type promotion from, from adding two elements of type X is different than subtracting or multiplying two elements of type X. Like John McFarland's elastic integer proposal that I mentioned, each integer is parameterized on the number of bits that is used to represent the integer. If I have two 20-bit integers and I add them together, I get a 21-bit integer. If I have two 20-bit integers and, uh, and I multiply them together, I get a 40-bit integer. If I have two 20-bit integers and I subtract them, well, maybe I get a 19-bit integer. I don't know. But we provide this flexibility so that users, if they need to, they can customize these things to provide sp specific performance for their specific types. So we have element promotion traits for each of the four arithmetic operations, engine promotion traits for the four arithmetic operations, and arithmetic traits for the arithmetic operations. Finally, at the bottom, we come to the second customization point, the matrix operation traits selector. This is the type which in an, in an operator decides what's my resulting operation traits type. And you'll see an example of this in a few moments. We have operators. Uh, this is the operator, uh, right, addition for vectors and matrices. We have subtraction for vectors and matrices. We have negation for vectors and matrices. We have multiplication. So here we have scalar multiplication. And because we're not assuming, we're, we on, are only assuming that element types are non-commutative rings, we have both forms, right? Uh, we have, uh, so we have here multiplication of vector times matrix and matrix times vector. And so when vector pre-multiplies matrix, we assume that the vector is a row vector. When a vector post-multiplies a matrix, we assume that it's a column vector. Yes, Zach. Sorry, couldn't hear you. The are that is up to the implementer. Really? That has to be part of the interface. So yes, it, it, it depends, right? If you if you are implementing two, if you're implementing addition, for example, of the fixed size engine, you know at compile time if the sizes, if I have a three by four and I'm adding it to a three by five, you can static assert that. Right? If I have a fixed size engine and I'm adding it to, and I'm using it in an operation where I'm adding a dynamically resized engine, then I would need to maybe throw an exception or do something at runtime, right? Is it related to my question of dimensional promotion? Because you can add up two vectors to those different dimensions. The, the way you get to that information has to be part of the standard, right? Right. It has to be specified. I think that's what Zach is asking. Yeah, because you, you basically in that second case, you have okay, to I, yeah. right? Those are right. Okay, so, so I anticipate that, yes, we would specify that exceptions get thrown, at least for the, the engines that are provided as part of the standard, right? Yes? Uh, would there be an opportunity to specify if a vector is a row or a column vector? Because usually if you use them in the wrong direction, it's an implementation error. So... The decision that we've made, and we got support from this in Kona, was to have one vector type and the meaning of the vector be dependent on the context. So, as I said, if, if I'm multiplying a vector in a matrix, the assumption in that case is that the vector, if vector times matrix is a row vector. Matrix times vector, the vector is a column vector. Then, then one other question, will be a, a matrix n times one, and a, a one times n matrix, Yes, you could. I think that that's an implementation issue. There's nothing that prevents one from instantiating a, a matrix that has one row or one column. And in that case, you get the outer product, certainly. The inner product gives you a one-by-one one matrix, right? If you're willing to live with a one-by-one one matrix as the result of an inner product, sure. So this basically you'll implicitly broadcast the vector to the matrix depending on the vector matches the row or the column, basically, is that how it works? So, so the question is, I'm implicitly broadcasting the vector depending on its context. 
The shape of the vector, the orientation of the vector, depends on its position as an operand in the expression. That, that's all I'm trying to get at here. In other words, you get linear algebra semantics, not non-like semantics. Uh, one more question, I really have to move on. Uh, I'll save it for later. Okay. All right, finally, there are some, just to make it easy for users, there are some convenience aliases. Uh, Dyne vector and Dyne matrix, which are basically just uh, take one template parameter and default their allocator type, similar to, say, vector or list. And there is FS vector and FS matrix, which, you know, cut down on some of the typing uh, for, uh, uh, you know, ordinary users. So let's look at numeric traits. The purpose of numeric traits is to specify and test the properties of numeric types. Uh, again, intended to be partially specializable. This is copied from earlier slide. The things that are highlighted are things that I'm going to show you. So first, I'd like to show you an implementation detail of how I might go about implementing number traits. So hidden in a detail namespace, I have something called built-in number traits and non-number traits. For built-in number traits, I have three nested type defs, is field, is ring, is non-commutative ring. And for, for that particular type, I set them all to be stood true type. For non-number traits, I set them all to be false type. Uh, inside, uh, inside the detail namespace as well, I create a little a parameterized helper alias, which looks at the type T, and if it's an arithmetic type, it returns the type built-in number traits. Um, and then using stood conditional here to, re in effect, return the type. If it's not a built-in arithmetic type, it returns the type non-number traits. And then my implementation below for the primary template of number traits, it's publicly derived from my helper trait, which looks at the type of the implementation. So if the implementation is an arithmetic type, it's going to be derived from, it's going to be publicly derived from built-in number traits. If it's not an arithmetic tri type, it's going to be publicly derived from non-number traits. This is not necessarily the best implementation, but it's one that works now. It's sufficient for my purposes. As an example, another example of how it might be used, I could imagine the standard including a specialization for complex of T. So complex of T uh, would have number traits that are the traits that are associated with the underlying element type of the complex number, right? So the question was about is field, is ring, is non-commutative ring. How could those be used? Well, the idea is to leverage the fields that are part of number traits, which is the customization point, and they would be applied to the predicate traits. So you don't you don't specialize the predicate traits, you specialize number traits because the predicate traits depend on number traits. And that way you get the predicate traits is field, is ring, is non-commutative ring to provide answers based on your custom numeric type. And then finally, predicate traits type for matrix elements. Uh, here, for now, we've chosen, it may relax us, but we've chosen to say uh, a type T is a legitimate matrix element if T is an arithmetic type, or T meets the definition of field. It doesn't necessarily need to be a field. I think it may be sufficient for matrices and vectors to be non-commutative ranks. It may need to be fields for computing determinants and higher order things, but for, for these simple operations, uh, rings may be sufficient. And then there's a helper trait, uh, you know, just to uh, a, a helper type alias. So let's look at the engines. I'm going to quickly go through three different engines, the dynamically resizable matrix engine, the fixed size matrix engine, and the matrix transpose view as an example of a view engine. So the matrix engine, the top of the matrix engine, looks remarkably similar to stood vector. Uh, I'm here at the top, I'm using the type tag. Uh, that This is a resizable matrix engine tag. I've nested aliases for element type and value type, allocator type, reference, pointer, const reference, const pointer, the kind of things that you see in the standard containers. Uh, difference type, one thing that we do different from the standard containers is we distinguish between the size type and the index type. Um, you know, there's this whole 
size t versus s size t discussion in the question of whether or not uh, uh, member functions that return size should be returning size or uh, signed or unsigned types. So we basically say, all right, we're going to punt on this question. For, for member functions that return size, we're going to use size type. For member functions used for indexing, we're going to use indexing type. And for now, they're all going to be the same type. They're going to be put or diff t. We also here have a nested type def called size tuple, which is just a pair of two sizes for convenience. So that you can return the size of a matrix in one object instead of, instead of two. Could I get it from the allocator type? I, mean, wouldn't need more generosity I could do that. I could do that. I chose not to. There's no reason why it couldn't be done. So, uh, for, for what it's Zach. Worth, for what it's worth, we stop doing that. Stop doing what? Getting the size type from the allocator type. In, in the specification of new containers and new adapters, we started doing it this way. So, Zach's comment is that in the specifications for newer containers and container adapters, they no longer extract size type and difference type from the allocator. Instead, they specify it directly. Am I getting that right? OK. So moving on, we also provide some nested type defs, similar to what allocator traits does, for, for specifying certain properties about the engine. Is it fixed size? Well, in the case of dynamic resizable, no, it's not. Is it resizable? Yes, it is. It's a true type. Is it column major? Uh, in this case, no, it's not. Is it dense? Yes. Is it rectangular? Yes. Is it row major? Yes. This is not an exhaustive or final set of properties, but it's an example of properties that one might define about the engine. We also define view types. And the view types are, are instantiated in terms of the engine. So our column view type is the matrix column view class instantiated in terms of this engine. Same thing with row view and transpose view. All of the view types are parameterized in terms of some engine over which they provide a view. And then we've got you know, the special member functions uh, and, and constructors. Very straightforward. Uh, for here for instantiation, the first uh, near the bottom, the two constructors that take sizes. Uh, you, know, you can specify rows and columns, or rows and columns, and row capacity and column capacity in one shot. You have the member functions that you might expect for indexing elements in a const, in a const fashion, for returning the number of columns and rows, the size, in this case size is returned as that size tuple, so I can work with a tuple instead of multiple calls doing individual things. Same thing with the column capacity, the row capacity, and the capacity of the matrix in, a, in entirety, again as a pair of sizes in a size tuple. Jasper. They could, be, they could be stood array. There's no reason why they could not be stood array. We chose tuple for now. Send me a note so I remember to make that change. I would really like to avoid stood get. OK, that's fine. <laughs> no, that's, that, that's a legitimate, that's a very legitimate uh, uh, bit but of feedback. Are context, for example, then, uh, there's only two. There's always two. There's always two. Well, one of the two. Uh, sorry, Ben? This one? No, the, yeah, this one. So his column major and his row major could be opposites here. Um, they are in this case. Can they both be true? Can they both be false? Is there any? So th that's that's that so that's a good question. You know, I've not worked out. We've not worked out all of the rules for this. Uh, consider an engine, some other type of engine that represents a sparse matrix. It could be that they are both false. Could they both be true? I can't think of an example on the, off the top of my head whether or not that, that could be. Maybe someone. Yeah, it's possible. I saw this slide and it just sort of, it seemed like a pitfall to have this column major and this row major be able to be independently set for most use cases. For most use cases, but there, I, I guess I was thinking of the case of a sparse engine where they would both be false. Okay, so moving on, uh, 
mutable element access. So there are some member functions here uh, for mutating and moving around the elements of the engine. Uh, we have, of course, mutable referencing. We have functions for doing assignments and swaps, uh, swapping, in, swapping the contents of two engines, swapping two columns, swapping two rows. Uh, we also have functions for reserving excess capacity and for resizing uh, to a specific number of rows and columns or resizing to a specific number of rows and columns and specifying excess capacity at the same time. Finally, as a possible, not a specified, but a possible private implementation might look like this, where you have a pointer based on the allocator's pointer type that points to some array of elements. Excuse me. You have the number of rows, the columns, row capacity, column capacity, and you maintain a local instance of the allocator. Let's look at the fixed size matrix engine. Very similar, the same but different, right? So here we're going to st we, we statically assert, I, I think the, yes, so we statically assert on the element type to make sure it's a legitimate matrix element. And with fixed size engine, we do the same thing. We also statically assert on the number of rows and columns to make sure they're greater than or equal to one, right? We do the same sort of business with the engine category. Uh, this is a mutable engine. Uh, we specify the element types, reference, pointer, const reference, indexing type. Just to do something different, and I'm not saying this is part of, I, I implemented index type and size type to be different than uh, for that of the dynamic engine just to make sure that things compiled and worked properly and there weren't lots of errors. That will probably change uh, later on. So here is a, a corresponding set of, uh, of, of those type traits. In this case, fixed size is true and resizable is false, but column major, density, rectangularity, row major, those are the same. Uh, the column view, row view, and transpose view, again, those use the view types instantiated in terms of the fixed size matrix engine. Here are the number of, you know, we only have the special member functions. We have const referencing, the const element access and, and const accessors. We have mutable element access in the ability to change elements, but what we do not have is we do not have resize or reserve. The number of rows and columns the row capacity and column capacity is fixed. Therefore, there is no need to have resize or reserve as member functions of this. It is not resizable. It is not reservable. Therefore, those member functions don't exist in this engine. And in the bottom, as a possible implementation, perhaps I have some linear array of elements that has R times C elements in it. Let's look at the transpose view. So here's a transpose view. It's parameterized in terms of some other engine type. And here it asserts that the type ET is a matrix engine, and that's a little helper trait that's not part of the public interface. And what it does is it says, all right, I'm a const matrix engine tag, which means I don't have any mutable access to elements. My element and all my other properties, element type, reference pointer, index type, those all come from the engine, the engine that I'm parameterized in, term of, in terms of. And all of, basically all of my properties are uh, parameterized in terms of, of the engine, right? Except for column major and row major are swapped here, right? Because it's a transpose. And the column view of me is the column view of me, the transpose. The row view is the row view of me, the transpose. And I can define a transpose type, which is the transpose of me, a transpose. And if you actually do it, if you do uh, m dot t dot t, you get something that's equivalent to m, right? It should work. We have const indexing, we have the const access, and the implementation is that I'm a view type, I'm a non-owning view type, I'm just gonna point to some instance of some other engine. And that engine could be another transpose engine which points to another engine, right? And I don't have it on the slide, but the indexing operator is basically implemented in terms of swapping the two indices of the underlying engine. So the matrix operation traits, all right, we're gonna look at matrix, the operation traits and matrix. 
So here's matrix operation traits. It's a container traits type. It contains the promotion traits for negation, addition, subtraction, multiplication, engine promotion traits for the four operations, arithmetic traits for the four operations, and that's it. It's a container type that holds all of the different kinds of promotion that, and arithmetic that needs to be done that I want this type to, to use. So vector, well, this is stood colon colon math colon colon vector. And uh, I'm not looking forward to the bike shedding on that. Um, <laughs> oh, I love using namespace math. Okay. All right, so the important properties of regarding element type, just like with the transpose view, they come from the engine, right? The engine determines those things. And so, uh, in the case of vector, there's really no transpose in our conception of vector, so the transpose type is just a const reference to this object, right? The Hermitian type, which is, uh, the Hermitian type is a vector if the, if the elements are complex. If the elements are non-complex, it's just the transpose type. And the idea being, it, if, it's, if it's a complex vector, then you actually need to fill a vector with the conjugate transpose of the elements and return that by value, right? Whereas, if they are, if they are non-complex elements, you can just, the transpose can be a reference to this thing. The other properties, is fixed, is resizable, they all take their cue from the engine. And the interface to the vector is very similar to the interface of the engine, right? With the difference that in some of the constructors, we sphene out some of the constructors, and yes, we sphene out, in or out, some of the constructors and assignment operators based on whether or not the engine type is resizable. If the engine type is not resizable, then we sphene out uh, the second two constructors that you see there, right? There's no sense in sending those dimensions to a fixed size engine type because it doesn't have constructors that take those dimensions. So we sphene those away. And uh, you know, we do the same thing, uh, I think we do the same thing, we do the same thing with reserve and resize. If the underlying engine type is not resizable, then we sphene those things out of the interface. And the enable if, enable if resizable, that's a private uh, implementation trait. And so vector owns an engine, right? Jeff. Can you see the, <coughs> excuse me, can you see the element access thing? I think it might have been in one of the previous slides. I didn't quite um, see it. This one? Uh, the one that shows like the operator paren, I think yeah. that's, that's no. okay. Yeah. So it returns a reference. It returns, it returns const reference. Const reference. Const reference is defined by the engine type. It, it can be a value, it can be a value. It can be a value. It's up to your engine to define, your engine defines what reference and const reference are. Yeah. Oh, so the vector, as I was saying, the vector, uh, the vector contains an engine, right? It's a wrapper to the engine. Matrix is very similar. And you see that the same idioms, the same patterns occur over and over again. One interesting, uh, again, uh, again with the Hermitian type, if it's a complex element, the, the return type is a, is a matrix. If it is not a complex element type, the return type for the Hermitian function dot h is the transpose type, right? And here again, we're sphening out the constructors that have to do with resizability. We have uh, the const element access. Uh, we have here at the bottom, we're seeing the use of the view types for column and row. Remember that uh, column type is a vector which is based on a matrix column view, and row type is a vector whose engine is a matrix row view. Uh, then our element mutating operations, uh, and some of those are sphenate out if the underlying engine type 
is, does not allow mutable access, like for a matrix that's instantiated in terms of a transpose type, does not allow mutable access to the elements because the, the transpose type represents a const view of a matrix. Zach. So is there any allowance for an expression template backend? Like that's a good question. We'll get to that. That's a very good question. We'll get to that. The, Yes, the short answer is yes. All right, size and capacity management uh, and containing the engine. All right, now we got through sort of the boring stuff. This is what I think is the interesting stuff. How does it work? Hopefully this will answer some questions. Let's add two matrices. Let's suppose I have a dynamic matrix of float and a fixed size matrix of double. And let's assume they're both four by fours for the sake of argument, right? Well. So this is the use of those convenience aliases I mentioned. This is what I expect a lot of people would use most of the time. Well, what are those things really? Well, those are really aliases for a matrix of a, a dynamically resizable matrix engine of float, whose allocator is an allocator of double, who's using the standard matrix operation traits. And similarly for the, for the second uh, M2, which is a fixed size matrix. So let's call some function that puts some values in those. Doesn't matter what it does. Let's add them together. So we want to know, what is the type of MR? Specifically, what is the element type in my result? What is the engine type of that result? And what is the operations traits type of that result, right? So what's that? Sorry, we need to look at this. We're going to look at this expression, M1 plus M2. So this takes us to the matrix addition operator. There's the signature. It's got some stuff in it, some compile time stuff to help us figure those questions out. So the first thing we do is we're going to try and figure out what's the operation traits for the resulting type. And I'm going to call this type alias for the matrix operation trait selector. It's going to take me to use the matrix operation traits template. And the selector underscore T is just a, a convenience alias, right? Matrix operation trait selector is one of the customization points. There's the primary template. We provide the specialization at the bottom. If both operation traits are the same, then the resulting operation traits type is T1, or, or is the same type. We also provide specializations for the case where one or both operands are the default matrix operation traits. Now, if you supply a matrix operation traits that's different than the default, we assume that that's the one you want, and that's the type that's going to be used. And so we have the two partial specializations you see at the top to cover that case. We have the full specialization at the bottom that says, all right, if both are, are the default matrix operation traits, then the resulting operation traits is the default, right? Makes sense. All right, so we've just determined what the operation traits are for the result. Well, we know a priori, we can, you know, by inspection, what the operand one type is. We know what the type is of the second operand, and I'm just spelling them out explicitly here. Now we're going to go to add traits, and when we spell that out, this is the matrix addition traits that we're going to use, right? We're telling, we're going to call matrix addition traits, and we're going to say matrix addition traits, the resulting operation traits is matrix operation traits. Here are the types of the two matrix operands. We drop into matrix addition traits. Matrix addition traits says, okay, I'm going to add two things, and you'll see at the bottom is a member function that actually does the addition. But before I can add them, I need to know what are the, what's the resulting engine type, right? So I'm going to drop into matrix addition traits, or matrix engine, matrix addition engine traits. I drop into this. This is the base class template. This template is applied when the system doesn't know what the two types of engines are. But, as it so happens, we have a partial specialization in the library for the case where the left-hand operand is a dynamically resizable engine, and the right-hand operand is fixed size. Great. This partial specialization is the one that's going to get matched. I've matched it. Well, the engine says, well, I'll tell you what type it is, but first, I need to know what's my element type. So then, I go into the matrix addition element traits, and that just sort of does the standard thing that you might expect. It says, let the type, let the two types tell me what the resulting type is. And so I look at the decal type of the decal val of addition, and you see the little work through the logic there at the bottom. Okay, well, my two types, I've got a float and a double. Add them together, the resulting type is double. 
Great. I know my element type is double. So come back up. Element type is double. Allocator type. Allocator type. This is just a little uh, helper traits that rebinds the allocator. Remember, the allocator was an allocator of float, so now I'm going to rebind it to allocator of double. And now I can determine what my engine type is. And in this trait, I've made the decision that if I add, if I have one operand, the left operand is dynamic and the right operand is fixed size, my result is a dynamically resizable engine. That's my engine type. Great. Now I know my engine type. I know my operation traits type by inspection because the operator told me what it was. Now I can compute my resulting type, the type of the matrix. So the resulting type is going to be a matrix, a dynamically resizable matrix of double whose operation traits are the matrix operation traits. And that's the type that's going to be returned from this member function add. So I've gone through some compile time calculations to figure out what's my resulting element type, what's my engine type, What's my resulting math object type? All right, great. I return for that. Now I want to do the addition. At some point later, this gets called at runtime, right? So I have the static function. It's getting called. It might look something like this, right? Very simple. There's some code to make sure that the sizes match. I instantiate my result type. Maybe I add some code there to make sure that the size of the result, the, that MR gets resized to be the right size to hold the result of the operation. I iterate over the two matrices and add the result and return it. This is a trivial sort of straw man implementation of how that might work. The important thing is that all of the types are promoted and what you would expect them to be. I return that. I'm done. So now I know what the resulting type is. Does that make sense? All right. This is easy because everything is default. Let's look at something that's a little harder and talk about real customization, right? All of this machinery is not necessary if everything matches. If all you needed to do was determine, hey, I'm, I'm always going to use dynamically resizable matrices and all I need to do is figure out the element type. You don't need all this machinery. But suppose I have a custom element type. I've created a class, new num. Doesn't matter what it is, but it purports to be a number. Right? So I have a nice member function interface with all of the arithmetic operations, the self-assignment operations, and uh, unary negation and addition that you might expect. And I've defined a bunch of binary operators. And I've gone to the trouble of, of figuring out what the resulting type should be uh, in the case where I have mixed expressions. And I've decided, hey, if I'm adding a new num to some other type, my result's always going to be a new num. But the important thing is that I can use that element traits promotion, decal type, decal val expression on this, and I will get a type answer out of it, right? So how do I integrate this? So our goal is to have a matrix with elements of type new num that participates in the arithmetic expressions. How do I integrate it? Well, my type new num is in my namespace. In my namespace, I'm going to specialize, uh, I'm going to specialize the number traits type. And in this case, I've decided that new num is a non-commutative ring, it's a ring in its field, and I set those to true type. That's all I need to do. And keeping in mind that, uh, that this operator has been defined as for new num, if I have a dynamic matrix of float and a fixed size matrix of new num, my resulting type MR in that expression is going to be a dynamically resizable matrix whose element type is new num. So I've done the element promotion to new num. I've done the engine promotion from fixed size and dynamic to dynamic. And I've returned the correct math type, right? This is an easy example of customization. What about custom element promotion? Suppose for some reason I want to promote the result of any float float addition to double. Anytime two floats are added, I want to promote, I don't want to, I don't want the result to be float, I want it to be double. All right, how do I do that? I'm going to create a new element addition traits, right? And in that, given two types of float, I'm going to say my returning, my resulting element type is double. This is a new traits type that exist in my namespace. They just happen to have the signature, template signature that matches that of the default traits. 
and I'm going to create a new operation traits type. And in my operation traits type inside of it, I'm going to bundle my new element addition traits and I'm going to use the, I'm going to use the expected name element addition traits and I'm going to set the type alias equal to the custom addition traits that I just created, right? All of this stuff is my custom stuff and it exists in my namespace. I haven't touched anything in std math. So now I'm going to instantiate a matrix, uh, a fixed size matrix, a dynamically resizable matrix, and uh, that use the new custom operation traits, notice the right side template uh, parameter, and a dynamically resizable matrix that uses the default matrix operation traits. And I'm going to do those arithmetic operations. What are the results going to be? What are the result types? Well, they're what you would expect them to be. For MR1, if I'm adding M1 to M1, I expect it to be a fixed size engine, but I expect the element type to be double. Because my element promotion trait says I'm adding two floats, I want to double. And the same thing happens if I do it for a dy if I'm adding a dynamically resizable matrix to the fixed size matrix. But what's really interesting is the third case where I have a matrix that's using the default operation traits, and I have a matrix that's using my customized operation traits. Because of the way we set define the traits selector, my custom traits are going to take precedence over the default traits. And that's why my result type here is going to be my custom traits type. Because the specialization had it both ways. If custom traits was first and default traits was second or vice versa, in both of those cases, in the traits selection specialization, it picked the custom traits. Okay, so what if you have two custom traits? You have a disambiguator? Or if you have two custom traits, that's the reason why uh, matrix operation traits, uh, the matrix operation trait selector is a customization point specifically for the case where you have two custom traits. I can't decide what the resulting operation trait should be. You have to decide. All right. Good yes? Um, what about the internally held type? Is it still a float because the allocator is still float? Oh. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. That is the internally held type is double. I'm sorry. That's a cut and paste error. Okay. That's a cut and paste error. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good point. Thank you for pointing that out. These are not floats. These are doubles. This is, you know, Bob cutting and pasting at 3 a.m. Yeah, here it's the, the matrix engine is holding a double, but I cut and pasted in the wrong, as I cut, typed in these comments. These should actually be allocator of double. No, I'm asking how does the change happen, though? The, the, traits, the traits have an allocator type on it? No, the traits don't have an allocator type. The engine promotion traits re rebound the allocator from allocator float to allocator of double. Okay. I've got a few more minutes if you want to stick around. It's probably five minutes left. Um, all right. I, I promise to go quickly. Uh, engine type, similar idea. Say I want to create a new fixed size engine. I create what I would do is create my own, and I want to apply it to addition, I would create my own uh, addition traits type. I would add a partial specialization to detect that in expressions. And I actually, I'm going to add partial specializations to detect the case where I'm using my new fixed size type with the, with the standard one. And in all three cases, my resulting engine type is going to be my new fixed size type. I'm going to add those engine addition traits to my custom operation traits, right? And so now, when I have addition operations, and I hope I cut and pasted this right, uh, all of my floats are going to be promoted to doubles, and in the case where both engines are fixed, I'm, my resulting engine type is going to be my new engine type, and in the case where it's dynamic engine, it'll be a dynamic engine. And ah, I cut and pasted it wrong again at the bottom. That's double at the bottom. But the important point is, for the first three expressions, my engine, the element promotion applied, so I got float and float and got a double. My engine promotion applied, I got a fixed size matrix engine of test type. And, um, and in the bottom, I got a dynamically resizable engine whose allocator really is double. Custom arithmetic, I think this is the thing that people are going to be most interested in. 
I'm going to create a custom addition trace type, and here I'm really going to I'm really going to drill down. I'm going to say that in the case where I have a fixed size matrix engine, my new engine, and I have matrices of double, and my size is three by four, only in that case do I want to apply my customized uh, add operation at the bottom of the traits there. But could you use that to extend it to add matrices that are like three, four? And you could make it whatever you want it to be. It, it depends on the level of creativity that you want to go to with custom adding full and partial specializations of the traits. Right? So anyways, let me go quickly. So here, here I'm going to use my new addition traits. And here I'm going to have a fixed size matrix of my test engine, a float, and one of double. Here I'm going to get the expected sizes. The only difference is going to be, in the first two cases, one or both of my operands was the, en was the matrix engine type of float. So I'm going to call my standard matrix addition traits add member function. Only in the third case, where both operands have the engine type, fixed engine type of double of three, four, and in that case, I'm going to call my custom arithmetic operator. So in this particular instance, I created a traits type and a specialization that only gets called in this one particular circumstance, this particular engine of this particular size, and in that one and only case, my custom addition gets called. In every other case, every other case, uh, the regular addition gets called. So I'm able to customize at a very level, of, a very narrow or even greater level of granularity. It depends on how creative you want to be. Quickly. Ongoing work, conceptification, yes, concepts need to be looked at and thought about. Integration with MD span, we've talked about using MD span as a basis for representing some of the engines. Uh, I think that could work. We've talked about using MD span as a lingua franca for communicating uh, sizes and dimensions between things, other parts of the library. Integration with executors. Uh, to be done, support for concurrency, whether it's executors or some other concurrency mechanism, the idea of having generic execution contexts. Uh, Zach, getting to your question, we need to build proof of concept sets of engines and arithmetic traits that employ expression templates and also that demonstrate concurrency. There's nothing in the architecture that prevents you from writing a set of expression templates. In fact, if you think about it, the transpose engine, in a sense, is an expression template, right? So there's nothing to keep you from creating the rest. Just, you know, in my copious spare time, I've been too lazy to do it, right? All right, that's it. Thank you for, for staring, staying with me. I know it was very long. <laughs> <laughs>